we have a really exciting session coming up and I'm really pleased to be able to introduce our next speakers. So born in Madeira Island and raised in Azores, Joanna de Rosa has a deep connection with the ocean, which led her to become a marine biologist, recently enrolled in a conservation master's degree at ISPA University. She's a member of Straw Patrol, an environmental awareness organisation aimed at bringing awareness to the problems of marine litter through beach cleanups and lectures at primary, elementary and high schools. She's joined by Dr. Ricardo Serrao Santos, the Portuguese Minister of Maritime Affairs, a member of the European Parliament between 2014 and 2019. And they're currently the principal researcher at the University of the Azores and president of the Institute of Marine Research. We also have today live with us, Emmanuel Goncalves, who is an administrator and member of the executive committee of the Oceano Azul Foundation a marine biologist and doctorate by the University of Lisbon. He's an associate professor at ISPA, University Institute Centre for Marine and Environmental Sciences. He's a member of the National Council for the Environment and Sustainable Development, the author and co-author of more than 80 scientific publications in international journals. He was an adjunct to the mission structure for sea affairs where he contributed to the approval and implementation of the national strategy for sea in 2000. Six. And our final member of this session is Nobertu Sherpa, who was born in the Azores, where he worked as a fisherman and became a technician at the Department of Oceanography and Fisheries at the University of the Azores. He started his own dive company, Nobertu Divers, which has become world renowned for whale watching, swimming with dolphins and coastal shark diving tours. So this is a really exciting session for Dr. Ricardo Serrano Santos, who is going to contextualise the Portuguese National Sea Strategy for 2030 and explain how that's linked to the 30 by 30 target. And then we'll have Emmanuel and Roberto who are going to take us through a new MPA classification system and how we can help protect our shared blue planet. And all of this will be hosted by the fantastic Joanna. So Joanna, please do take it away. So hi everyone, uh, I'm so excited to be here today and I would like to welcome uh, everyone to this session. Uh, as uh, Maviri already said, uh, I'm a, the Portuguese uh, Youth at Time um, World Ocean Day Youth Advisor and I'm a member of Straw Patrol, an environmental awareness campaign. Uh, and I would like to uh, thank uh, my guests, uh, Professor Emmanuel Gonçalves, um, he is the chief scientist and the mo a board member of Oceano Azul Foundation and an associate, associate professor at Ishpe University, the one that I'm enrolled to in a, a marine biology and conservation master degree. Uh, professor Emmanuel is also uh, the research, uh, researcher at MARE, uh, the Marine and Environmental Sciences Center. Uh, I would really like to thank to uh, Norberto Serpa, which is uh, one of my biggest mentors uh, and has been for the past two years. So to start uh, this session, um, I will uh, start by sharing a message from the Portuguese Minister of Maritime Affairs, Dr. Ricardo Serrão Santos, where he answers some questions I sent him related to the National Sea Strategy for 2030 and the 30 by 30 goal of protecting 30% of the ocean under Portuguese jurisdiction by 2030. I would also like to thank the minister and his cabinet for providing this pre-recorded video as he was not able to attend uh, this event today. So I will now... So for the first question, the minister was asked how does Portugal pretend to fulfill the political commitment to classify 30% of the maritime area under national jurisdiction as protected by 2030? É consensual que é necessário um esforço político e social acrescido para aumentar a área de oceano coberta por áreas protegidas, mas é também necessário melhorar os mecanismos de gestão dessas áreas e das áreas que vierem a existir durante esta década. Alinhado com os compromissos europeus e as tendências internacionais, Portugal, na sua recentemente aprovada Estratégia Nacional para o Mar, define como objetivo estratégico, um dos seus objetivos estratégicos, combater as alterações climáticas e a poluição e proteger e restaurar 
dos ecossistemas. Esta estratégia inclui uma área de intervenção dedicada à, à biodiversidade desculpem, e às áreas marinhas protegidas, que enquadra a medida emblemática de classificar pelo menos 30% das águas marinhas sob jurisdição nacional, de acordo com as metas europeias, incluindo 10% da área marítima sob proteção estrita. Sabemos que alcançar este compromisso político lança enormes desafios científicos, mas também sociais e económicos, que incluem, entre outros aspectos, a formação e a literacia dos oceanos, a vigilância e fiscalização. Reconheço que ainda há muito a fazer, mas o governo de Portugal está empenhado em ir para a frente. A ação em curso usa instrumentos técnicos que derivam da Diretiva Quadro Estratégia Marinha e das Diretivas da Rede Natura 2000 e assenta nas linhas de orientação estratégica e recomendações para a implementação de uma rede nacional publicada por resolução do Conselho de Ministros em 2019. O Plano de Situação do Ordenamento do Espaço Marítimo Nacional também concorre para este objetivo ao compatibilizar políticas setoriais da economia do mar com medidas espaciais de conservação da natureza, como as áreas marinhas protegidas. The second question is, within the already established marine protected areas, what measures are being implemented to allow a greater control and effectiveness? Portugal, no seu todo, including the Açores e a Madeira, tem 93 áreas marinhas protegidas, que cobrem neste momento cerca de 7% das águas e fundos marinhos, sob jurisdição nacional e correspondendo a mais de 304 mil km quadrados. Para alcançarmos as metas propostas, temos de acelerar o passo na retoma dos trabalhos que estavam em curso antes da pandemia. Recentemente, criámos um grupo de trabalho técnico interministerial que envolve o mar, o ambiente e os negócios estrangeiros, ou os ministérios destas áreas, com as respectivas regiões autónomas de Açores e da Madeira, e que prevê a colaboração da Academia, das organizações não governamentais do ambiente e de outras partes interessadas, como organizações de produtores e utilizadores diversos. Para agilizar a classificação de áreas marinhas oceânicas já identificadas e consolidar, portanto, as propostas de novas áreas a proteger. Neste momento encontra-se quase finalizado o plano que concretiza o documento que concretiza a Rede Nacional de Áreas Marinhas Protegidas e que estabelece o regime jurídico para a sua classificação e define a estrutura dos planos de gestão. O objetivo agora é incrementar o conhecimento científico necessário para a criação das áreas marinhas a proteger, para a definição das medidas de proteção a implementar e para a avaliação dos impactos dessas medidas nas atividades humanas e na preservação da biodiversidade e do património cultural, tal como é preconizado na Estratégia Nacional para o Mar. Por outro lado, as autoridades estão mais capacitadas para monitorizar e fiscalizar as atividades humanas no mar, principalmente através de sistemas remotos de observação, que incluem satélites e equipamentos de geolocalização das frotas. As for the last question, the minister was asked if this area, the 30% that will be classified as protected until 2030, will have a full protection rating. Não, eu como referi, a, a meta estabelecida na Estratégia Nacional para o Mar é dos 30% de cobertura de áreas marinhas protegidas, dos quais 10% serão de proteção estrita. Não é 30% de proteção estrita. O oceano em Portugal apresenta uma diversidade geomorfológica, oceanográfica e biogeográfica que, como sabem, se traduz numa riqueza geológica e biológica de elevado valor natural. É importante que durante esta década sejamos capazes de salvaguardar e preservar este património natural único. E esta é uma tarefa que tem de ser vista também como um contributo do país para o esforço europeu e global para uma melhor governação internacional dos oceanos. Depois da pandemia, temos de contribuir para que as dinâmicas políticas que estão a ser geradas pelo Pacto Ecológico Europeu e pela Agenda 2030 para o Desenvolvimento Sustentável. Mas é preciso ter em conta que estes processos relacionados com as áreas marinhas protegidas 
só têm sucesso se forem inclusivos. Isto é, antes de se definir com rigor a porcentagem do espaço marítimo nacional que deve ou não ficar totalmente protegido, é preciso envolver e dar voz às comunidades costeiras, em especial aos representantes do setor das pecas, das empresas marítimas turísticas, aos grupos de ação costeira, aos cientistas, às organizações não governamentais, aos agentes da administração pública, às indústrias, entre outros interessados. Este envolvimento exige conhecimento científico, liderança e a adoção de mecanismos participativos e de corresponsabilização desde o início do processo até a implementação e acompanhamento das medidas de conservação dos recursos da biodiversidade. Só assim será possível encontrar soluções, sinergias e parcerias para se propor e implementar em áreas protegidas que fundamentem o desenvolvimento das nossas comunidades costeiras de forma sustentável e que protejam o nosso capital natural, o capital natural das gerações vindouras. Somos todos chamados para respondermos a este signo nacional. Um, so I want to thank again uh, the minister and his cabinet for um, giving these, um, for answering these questions. I sent them. Um, they were really enlightening. And before passing the word to Professor Emmanuel, I would like to recall the last words from the minister where he said, we are all called to respond to this plan. Uh, so uh, we need to try our best to protect our ocean. Uh, and I will leave in the chat uh, then the, um, the 30 by 30 petition, where by signing it, you are telling the world leaders that you want action too. Uh, so now, Professor Emmanuel will present the Rise Up uh, Initiative, blue, uh, a blue call to action uh, that started with the partnership between Oceano Azul Foundation, Oceano Unite, uh, Ocean Unite, and Oak Foundation to bring together uh, representatives of fisher folk, indig indigenous people, ocean conservation organizations and foundations to agree on common prior uh, priorities and solutions needed to tackle the ocean crisis and raise the level of, level of ambition for action. Um, Professor Emmanuel will also explain the importance of marine protected areas for ocean conservation. Uh, thank you again for being here, Professor, and I will now pass you the Joana, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's a great pleasure. <clears throat> and um, let me start by sharing with you a small video about this uh, campaign. I hope it will um, work. Let me know, please, if it doesn't. something we know we can do, we know we must do. Can you hear it? Our voices speaking out together, our solidarity joining together, rising loud out of the silence where we learned. What, you might ask, that we must act together for nature. It's now or never. Join the hundreds of organizations that have already signed on to rise up for the ocean. Okay. Let me now go for <clears throat> the presentation. I hope you're able to see it. 
Yes? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So this small video is um, an introduction to the topic that I would like to bring to you today. And um, let me start by um, going through the background of what is the scientific consensus about where we are. And um, we are in a very special moment in time, uh, not only because we are facing a pandemic, but because we are learning as never before the current situation of the planet and in particular of the ocean. So the last three years were very important in this respect. We had these reports that I show here on this slide from 2018 and 2019 that really transform the message to the policymakers. These reports were uh, done by the IPCC, the Panel for Climate Change. And uh, the first one is a report on oceans and the cryosphere that showed uh, how the ocean is suffering from uh, climate change and also how the ice on the planet is changing. Um, the report of the IPVS, which is International pa the Intergovernmental Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, showed us that we have 1 million species in risk of extinction of the 8 million species that scientists estimate exist on the planet. The special report on 1.5 shows us where we are in terms of the Paris Agreement commitment. And finally, the first global assessment of the ocean give us the information about the status of the global ocean. And so these uh, four reports represent a synthesis of thousands and thousands of scientific papers that clearly show us that we are facing two existential challenges. We are facing a climate emergency, and it is an emergency because we have 10 years to solve it. But we are also facing a species extinction crisis, and this is less known by the general public. In the climate emergency, the science is clear, and the ocean is both a solution to this, this emergency, but also a victim of um, the um, climate change. And there is this triple threat that scientists have now clearly described. The first one is that the oceans are warming because more than 90% of the excess heat that are produced because of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are, is being absorbed by the ocean. But because the ocean also absorbs more than a quarter of the CO2, it's becoming acidified. And finally, recently, we also understood that because of all the nutrients that we put out in the ocean, the ocean is become deoxygenated. And so this triple threat has a number of cascading effects throughout the ocean ecosystems with strong consequences for the economy and for the social well-being of uh, the human population. And I'll go through <clears throat> these um, main topics uh, very briefly. On the warming, it is clear from this graph where we are. So this represents the global mean temperatures from the 1850s to now. And everything that is blue is um, values below average. Everything that is orange and red are values above average. And so it's clear that uh, the decade that we just finished was the warmest ever registered um, since there are records on the, on the planet. The years 16, 19, and 20 were the warmest ever. And the 10 warmest years have occurred all since 2005. And so we have an escalating effect uh, of the climate system and the climate system is showing us that the situation is out of control. We also have now data showing us that the ocean absorbs the, all this heat, 93% of this heat goes to the ocean, 63% of these to the surface layers until 700 meters, but the rest, the other 30% to the deeper layers below 700 meters to 2000 meters. So scientists once thought that the deep ocean was sheltered from change and from warming, and then we now know that this is not so. At the global level, we have already an increase of 0 0.676 uh, degrees, which don't, don't look like as much, but you can imagine the ocean is huge. And so the amount of heat which is needed to um, explain this increase is also huge. And so, this um, increase in ocean temperature is also accelerating. And we know that um, the amount of carbon dioxide that exists now in the atmosphere 
in 2019, it was uh, 409.8 parts per million, was never seen before, at least in the, in the last 800,000 years, as you can see here, the global uh, CO2 levels in the atmosphere have been quite stable. And now they have increased, of course, because of the uh, human uh, influence. And we know that the last time levels were so high were about two to three million years ago. What happens when all this CO2 enters the water? Well, it interacts with the water, it forms carbonic acid, and this carbonic acid then decomposes and um, decreases the amount of uh, carbonate ions that are in the ocean and increases the amount of hydrogen ions. And this has two consequences. One is that the lower of the carbonate ions means that animals in the ocean that use this carbonate for their shelters, shells, or for their skeletons don't have so much carbon available, carbonate available. And the increase in hydrogen is what is changing the pH. And so the pH is decreasing because of this. And these effects are already being seen because this um, acidification is not the same throughout the oceans. And the predictions by the end of the century show us that some of the animals in the ocean will already have problems in forming their um, uh, shells and their skeletons by the end of the century. This report by the IUCN was published in 2019 and also show us that the at the global level, the oxygen levels have already decreased by 2%. And this means that in some regions, we have lots of hypoxic areas, so areas with no oxygen increasing all over the world. More than 500 of these have already been detected. But even on the open ocean, some animals which are of high metabolism, such as billfishes or tunas, are not able anymore to dive as deep as they were to feed because the waters uh, down there are with not enough oxygen to uh, allow them to go to the deepest waters where they used to go and to feed themselves. So of course, this will have huge consequences for uh, the uh, life on the ocean, but also huge consequences for humans because we use these resources in our economy. And so having a clear picture about the climate emergency, where are we today? in terms of projections. So this is the um, amount of greenhouse gases emissions that we have today. And this green light, this green curve that you see here is where we need to go in order to keep warming at 1.5 degrees, which is the, as you all know, the Paris Agreement. But currently the, the policies that are being uh, agreed by countries put us in the path that by the end of the century, we'll have two to three degrees uh, warming. And uh, the worst case scenarios, it will be around four degrees warming. So there is a, a need for transformative change in order for us to be able to go over what we call in science tipping points, which is these points where if we reach them, we cannot go back anymore. In 2021, we already registered 1.2 degrees of warming compared to pre-industrial levels. So this is an emergency because of this. This is an emergency because we need to bring this change and we need to bring this change now. But we also have this species extinction crisis, which is a less known uh, factor of our uh, impact on the planet. And in fact, even in the ocean, and this is probably a number that most people don't know about, only about 13% of the ocean remains intact. And so science tells us also that in the ocean, the global levels, <clears throat> the levels of impact are also um, enormous. And this paper by Benjamin Alpern in 2008 and his colleagues has clearly painted this picture where you see all these oranges, all these reds are areas of high or very high impact of human activities. So a large impact, a large part of the ocean <clears throat> is already impacted by human activities. And of course, the main human activity in the ocean that is causing this is fishing. And on this graph by the FAO, you can see here on orange what's happening with the global fisheries from the 1950s to now. So in the 1950s, <clears throat> we extracted around 20 million tons of fish. Now the numbers are already on uh, almost 100 million tons. And <clears throat> the most significant part of this graph is that after the 80s, this number have not increased. 
in spite of the many improvements in technology, many improvements in uh, capacity, we are not being able to extract more fish from the ocean. And the stocks of most of these fishes are overfished. In fact, for some of the species, for some of the big predators, what is left in the ocean is less than 10% what it used to be there in the 50s. So in less than 50, 70 years, we were able to wipe out 90% of the big predators on the ocean. And this is all, also what science shows us. So there is a clear message here. And the message is that we know. We cannot claim anymore that we don't have the knowledge. We cannot claim anymore that we don't have the science to act. The science is here and the science is clear. And the science is also telling us what we need to do. And are, there are three main things which are clearly in front of us that we need to do. The first one is that we need to save what's left. There's not too much nature already left. And there are still these special places in the ocean and we need to protect them and we need to protect them now, not in 2030, because in 2030, it will be too late. We need to protect these special places right now. But this is not enough because as, we, as I've, I've shown you, only 13% of the ocean remains intact. And so we need to have a huge effort to rebuild the ocean. And finally, we need to stop doing things <clears throat> in the current way. We need to stop destroying nature. And so we need to change the way that we manage the ocean. We need to change the way that we explore the ocean. And so we need to make all these ocean activities sustainable. And this is where the rise up um, call to action comes uh, to try to address these issues. This is an international effort. You can um, understand more about this on this website, riseupfortheocean.org. Any organization can um, uh, sign up to this Rise Up. And uh, it is an unprecedented joint call to action by civil society that is calling governments and businesses to take action and to take action now in 2021. We cannot wait for 2030. So this um, started as an initiative, as Joanna was saying, by several partners, among which the Oceano Zoo Foundation, but also, also Ocean Unite, the Oak Foundation, and many big philanthropies, uh, large organizations, uh, big NGOs, but also fish folks organizations, indigenous peoples representatives, and uh, <clears throat> all these organizations have come up together to build an agenda for change, an agenda that can reply to these challenges that we have in front of us. And now currently more than 500 organizations are behind in this initiative. And uh, <clears throat> we plan to bring this to the next United, United Nations Ocean Conference that will happen in Lisbon in 2021. And let me just briefly explain to you what is this agenda for change. So Rise Up is built around these six letters where each letter represents a challenge that this block, Blue Call to Action is trying to address. And I'm going to briefly, briefly um, drive you through these challenges. So the R is to restore ocean life. And this is where we have a number of actions which are directly to do exactly that, to recover, the depleted fisheries, to forbid the most damaging uh, fishing practices, to uh, bring transparency to fisheries and bring transparency into the way that we're exploring the ocean. And let me highlight this uh, transformative action that was agreed by this, all these parties, which is um, to prioritize access to small scale fisheries of the territorial sea. The territorial seas are this area around all nations in the world on, of 12 nautical miles that are being essentially overexploited by the industrial fishing. But this is the area where the small scale fishers, the coastal communities depend upon. And so these coastal communities are being hurt by these practices. And so we need to reserve this area to these sustainable practices of the small scale fishers and to push out the big offenders, which are the big industrial fishers that are essentially wiping out the livelihoods of all these communities throughout the world. <clears throat> the letter I is 
to invest on a net zero carbon emissions future. And this is where we have a number of actions that are directly to do uh, that decarbonization of our energy system, the decarbonization of our economies, but also to promote nature-based solutions, which is to rebuild nature because with more nature, we will have less carbon in the systems. We have less carbon in the ocean, less carbon in the atmosphere. And let me highlight this one, which is an obvious one. We know why this is happening. So we need to stop any offshore and oil and gas exploration, any new one, and we need to very rapidly phase out the uh, explorations which are active because this is the only way that we are able to stop or to, to uh, decelerate the changes in the climate is by decarbonizing the economy. And to do that, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. The letter S is to speed the transition to a circular and sustainable economy. And here again, we have a number of uh, actions very clearly directly to um, do that. And to have a sustainable and circular economy, we need to um, act in very different uh, fronts, from plastics to agriculture, to um, uh, finance mechanisms. And uh, let me highlight two of these actions, which are very important, we believe. One is that <clears throat> one of the reasons we think that we, um, why we destroy nature is because we don't value nature in our economic systems. So on the cost benefit analysis of decision makers, nature is not there. Intact nature is not there. A tree only has value if we cut it and if we sell it. And this needs to change. A tree needs to have value for the economy still alive. And this is where the blue natural capital in, in the case of the ocean or the natural capital in, in general uh, notion comes about because if we ha have this natural capital in this cost benefit analysis, we will change the equation of decision making. And of course, we have also to stop doing harm to the ocean. And now we are thinking about exploring the seabed mining, as you all know, exploring the minerals in the ocean. And this needs to stop and we need to um, be able to pass this message, this message throughout the world. And the youth is very important here. Do not allow the seabed mining to start because once the uh, economic activity starts, it's much more difficult to stop. But we have a chance to a chance to stop it now or to uh, not allow it to stop it now. And this is what we need to do. The letter E is to empower and support coastal people. And here, there are a number of actions directly to recognize the rights of indigenous peoples, recognize the, the rights and securing the rights of uh, coastal peoples to their livelihoods, to the, their social well being. And this is very important to bring them to the center of governance. And this is exactly what letter U is calling for a stronger global ocean governance. And here we are calling for, um, if you want, an ocean pact through a conference of heads of states in 2023, where this blue call to action can be, if you want, the agenda for such um, a heads of state conference to negotiate an ocean pact to bring all these actions together for change. And finally, last letter P to protect at least 30% of the ocean by 2030. And um, here, let me highlight, of course, the adoption of this uh, target by the Convention on Biological Diversity this convention is going to take place in October in uh, Kuming in China. And it's very, very important that this target is approved there because if it's not approved there, then we will don't, we'll not have a target for this next decade. And finally, we need to speed up the implementation of marine protected areas. And let me, let me finalize by showing you where we are in marine protected areas. Actually, we are at the global scale at around 7% of the ocean being protected somehow, but less than 2% of these areas are without fishing. So 93% of the marine protected areas that exist allow fishing. And the problem here is that we know these areas work and we also have a, already a plan for where to concentrate our attention for the 30 by 30, where to implement this 30%. The science is here. There are a number of studies that have shown where are these areas in the ocean that can and should be protected? And we also know by the scientific 
literature that when we fully protect these, marine, these areas, we'll have larger fish, we'll have more fish, we'll have intact ecosystems, we'll have more species. And so marine protection works if done right. But the problem is that most of these areas are not fully protected. And so what we have is uh, not what we should have. Because when these areas in the ocean are fully protected, all these fish, of course, will not stay inside marine protected areas. They will go and they will replenish fisheries. They will replenish the ocean. This is a, a picture from a marine protected area in Mexico that 20 years ago was a desert. And now is an ocean full of life because this is fully protected. And these communities are now living from ecotourism. They are bringing tourism underwater and they, they have the wealth both in the ocean and in their communities to show the, uh, that this works. But of course, this only works if we understand the science and if we do this right. So we know that the fish go through different life cycles. And so we need to protect all life cycles of the fish in order for marine protection to work. We know that they go in different systems. And so we need to integrate these different systems in the network of protected areas. We know that uh, uh, the food webs are very complex. And so we need to plan these protected areas in a way to integrate all this complexity of ocean systems. We know that some animals and plants travel a lot and some others travel very few distances when they are larvae and there are, the larvae connect the ocean. And so we need to take care of that. We also know that adults, some of them don't move at all and some others move a lot. So the, we need to adapt this protection to this reality. But when we protect these areas, when we allow the fish to grow, <clears throat> there is a big difference here. So this sea bass of 40 centimeters produces 230,000 young. But if you allow it to go double, we will not have double young. We will have an exponential number of young. And these young are survive better in the ocean. And so larger fish produce more young and these young are more resilient. And so marine protection, as you can see here, when they are fully protected, you'll have more fish, more biomass, more density, larger fish and more diversity. So the science is, complete, uh, is fully clear here. And inside the MPA by decreasing mortality will increase all these parameters of the um, food webs. We'll have more eggs and larvae. And of course, outside the MPAs, these adults and larvae will spill over to those systems and will replenish those systems. But as I was saying, many MPAs do not work because many MPAs in Europe, for instance, allow bottom trawling, which is the most destructive fishing practice that we have. And so this is not the right way to do this, but we know which is the right way. We know they need to be big, they need to be in place for a long time, they need to be fully or highly protected, well enforced, well regulated, if partially protected, they have to have full protection next to them. They have to have good, good governance models and they have to be integrated in networks. And finally, this was a classification system we developed to solve this problem of what works in marine protection. And now we know that by looking at the regulations, we can tell if an area works or if they don't work. We'll have scorecards showing how well protected are these areas based on the levels of protection that they exist. We have this website, classifympas.org, that allow you, any of you to go there, put in the numbers or the protection levels of an MPA and understand if they are working or not. And now we will have a new standard coming up, which is the MPA guide, which will have these levels of protection and stages of establishment to allow us to understand what are we protecting in the ocean after all. So finally, there are these we know what we need to do. There are these four transformational actions that need to be implemented. The first of those is to stop procrastinating, implementing the laws that we already have. We have lots of laws around, but we are just not implementing them. Then we need this global ocean pact and we need this 30% protection now. We need also to look at the exclusive economic zones as they are what they are, which are public goods. And we need to invert the burden of proof of conservation. We need to stop just closing areas for protection. We need to authorize every activity in the ocean, making sure that they are sustainable. And finally, the high seas 
which are the areas outside national jurisdiction, should be considered common heritage of mankind. And we should stop exploring the high seas in order for us to have a better future for this planet. So finally, this is their website again. Any of you can come and, uh, and uh, sign to Rise Up for the Ocean. And Joanna, thank you very much again for the opportunity to share these thoughts with uh, all of you. Thank you so much for your message. Uh, I think it was so clearly explained. Uh, and I think it's really important to know all the, the threats that our ocean is facing. And this message was also a message of hope that we, we are in a crisis, but we can still recover from it. So thank you so much for explaining all this so in such a clearly way. Um, so now uh, Norbert will give his testimony about the changes in the ocean that he has been witnessing and about the importance of preserving it. Before that, uh, I would like to say that Norbert works as a good Fayal Islands ambassador uh, in the world. Uh, he has crossed the Atlantic Ocean five times and he is dreaming of going all around the world one day. Uh, Norbe uh, Norbert too, has an environmental conservation organization named the Anticyclone Zussurs. Uh, and I will share a short video from the organization's uh, Facebook page that was filmed in the archipelago Las Perlas in Panama uh, to enlighten the subject of marine leader uh, so that Norberto can then share a message about this issue and uh, his experience on the ocean. Uh, this video is in Portuguese, but Norbert will then explain uh, what was said. Norberto, a pesca correu bem? Pois, a praia não era muito grande, mas estava mesmo bastante poluída, de li... bastante poluída, com muito lixo. Muito lixo, muita madeira, mas a madeira é normal, porque as ilhas têm som de fumada de madeira. Agora, depois de Panamá sair, enquanto toda a gente dizia que eram ilhas paraisíticas, nunca imaginei que ia encontrar tanto lixo. Claro que era quase impossível tirar o lixo da praia, humanamente impossível, não tivesse lá uma semana com sacos e muitas coisas para conseguir tirar aqui de lá, mas optei por trazer só sapatos, só chinelos. Como vocês como podem ver, isto estava mesmo pilhado por todo o lado. Acontece que já agora podia deixar, uma vez que isto são ilhas paradisíacas e que muita gente vai usufruir uh, destas ilhas, pelo menos uh, se toda a gente tomar uma atitude de trazer algum lixo e levar para o continente, para, para, para os, o caixão de lixo, se calhar as praias ficam menos poluídas e mais, mais outro, outra acessibilidade. Portanto, só se pode ir lá praticamente com a maré baixa, com a maré cheia, uh, tem até a água, chega ao limite do, do lixo, portanto, tem sítio qual, qual, qualquer para, para se poder uh, pôr os pés. Portanto, não sei qual será a melhor política, mas pelo menos a gente minimizar e trazer algum, cada vez que a gente for lá, trazer algum neste lixo. Uh, I will pass you now the word, Norbert. Uh, I'm so happy for uh, having you here. So do you want to explain uh, what yeah. you were saying on the video? Thank you, Joana. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me for uh, these big projects. And uh, congratulations for uh, your energy and your cause. It is very important and it's uh, global and take uh, part of uh, the hour dice. So I, this is a dream that I have since I am a child to have a boat and go around the world. And uh, with my head, I think uh, I go around the world, but I try to have some uh, talkings with the children in the school and uh, with the people about the, this big problem that you have uh, in the whole world. 
So in Panama, I stopped in Panama. I have been in the schools and in the museums to make some uh, talkings with the, with the children, with the people that pass by. And uh, when I when I focus uh, the beach and the places that I stop, uh, I saw so much pollution, so much pollution, and uh, make me very sad because, um, like everybody know, all America, South America, Central America, even uh, North America, we have um, they all kind of the, the pollution or the, the garbage that they put in the sea uh, with a um, stream core, with a Gulf stream, they have here in the Azores, this kind of the pollution. And that uh, make me very sad. Of course, uh, sometimes we, when you're talking about the pollution in the sea, in the, our islands, in the Azores, um, Every time I said, okay, pretension with this, pretension with, uh, with that, because uh, we take care more uh, about this environment. But I think there is many places that I stop until now. I, I'm now I, I'm, I stopped the boat in the French Polynesia. They are, we are a little bit in, uh, in front of these people. We are, uh, they take a few years for, uh, get one situation like we have in the Azores because we start many years ago we we give much energy and much power in uh, education in schools with the children so, uh, about the, the the oceans about the, our environment and of course um, we have many things for to do and you need to give the hands and uh, go more in front because that is this is a very big problem so like you know I grew in Pico in, in the Azores. I born in the Azores. I grew in the Azores. And since very young, I started to stay in the sea, to involve in the sea, to use the sea to live. Of course, I start like many of the fishermen. I start like a predator to catch fish for the farm or to bring the fish to home. But Joana, I, when, I, when, I start, when I start to fishing, when I start to put my head under, under water and start to see the marine life and uh, what kind of, what kind of the, the species of the biodiversity that you have around the islands, now in these 50, last 50 years, you have a very big chance, very big chance. So, and uh, we uh, change because they, we start to catch to fish like a commercial. Before it's only for uh, the local people, only for us, only for the Azores, but sooner you start to export, so they catch more and more. And they start to change the, the bottom, to change, to change the visibility of the water, to change the many ecosystems that I saw before. And uh, it is a uh, very big changes. Um, anyway, I, I'm happy because I started to see that there is many people, even uh, the politicals and the many organizations, many ONG, to talking about the big problem that we have in the ocean and stop a little bit fishing and uh, to try to take care with our ecosystems. Uh, I believe that uh, more and more there is people uh, to involve in that, but there is a, uh, not only for the plastic, not only the, the tools of the fishermen, not only the, the, the pollution, but at the moment I'm very sad because I, 20 years ago, I, I, when I start working in the university, uh, like a technique there with this marine biologist, I start to understand it more and uh, change a little bit my philosophy of the life and uh, the sensibility of uh, for the sea and for the ocean and the, even the respect of the ocean because sooner you start to understand more to start to learn about the ocean you start to it's uh, you start to to take care more with your with your your place and uh, uh, 20 years ago I start to see uh, the first uh, um, uh, the first uh, one algae that's called Calerpa, where Vienna, that arrived 20 years ago, and you can't believe it, 
How is the bottom at the moment around Fayala, around Monteguia, along this uh, reserva? So this is a very, in a very short future, maybe it's a big disaster in the Azores because in 20 years, there is miles and miles cover of these algae and no more algae, no end. If you, if you dive there and you stop and to start to look at this algae, no more, the, the fish, don't eat the, the algae and they cover everything and no more algae and even the the larvae and the fish it's uh, uh, they, they can survive uh, uh, there so i think it's a big problem because in last years they arrived pico they arrived at the other highlands and i believe it all they 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 go so fast in Fayal, I believe at the next future we have quite all Azores with Calerpa, and it's a very it's a very big problem at the moment in the in the in the, in the Azores. So, of course, it's very for for continue to have a good marine life, a good ecosystem around the Azores. It's very very important to 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 get more marine area protected areas. It's very, very important to have, to have this. So, um, my thank you so much for, yeah, yeah. for touching uh, this subject. Um, I would like to ask from the, the places you've been uh, all around the world, uh, which were the places that you found more, more litter on, on the beaches? Um, <laughs> It's a uh, in Central America is terrible. There is no doubt in Central America. Uh, I, after I sail into to Galapagos, after the Panama, I work a little bit uh, with the Darwin Foundation there, with uh, some marine biologists to take some sharks there, and they have many, many guardas, many guardas forestais, many. Guards. guards, many people involved in the environment and they take care with the marine life, with the all wildlife that they have there in Galapagos and there is many people, it's uh, it's very important this and they take care, it's uh, I, it, maybe it's the, the place in the Pacific that I saw more protected, more, they take care more and more ONGs work in this, more research people who work and uh, to know what's happened there. And after I go to, Poly uh, to French Polynesia, there is islands that have a little bit uh, pollution, but not like I saw in Central America. But um, I know, I know uh, for through the friends and through, through some organization that uh, sooner I go more in, more in front, more uh, Fiji, Vanuatu, and uh, Indonesia. It's terrible. It's worse and worse. So um, we need uh, sooner. We need quickly to take care with us. And uh, that is, um, it's like I tell you, we are in front of them uh, maybe thirty or forty years. So if you don't uh, take care with this environment, then there is even uh, in the place that I stop. Uh, you, Many places uh, at the moment you don't see the bottom. The, the pollution is just terrible. They threw away everything. They don't have. Uh, they don't take care with the environment. So we need to take many years for uh, for uh, for education for this. And yeah. um, so Laura uh, made a question. She has: Do you have one specific diving experience that stands out as your favorite? Uma experiência de mergulho favorita? Um, now, uh, now my, um, I have a diving center in the Azores and the, the, the things that I like to, to do with the guests is to take, explain how we can stay in the bottom without touching anything and how we can protect. And the, the, the impact of the divers in the underwater, it's very important to have the less impact possible in the ecosystems because the divers sometimes with the fins, with this, they can destroy some uh, nests of the, the, the fish or some uh, larvae, some, uh, something like that. It's very important to know how we, they can see without touching these stuffs and destroy this. It's very, very 
important for me. Uh, the more, uh, the best experience that I have uh, diving, of course, uh, I enjoy so much to, to dive in, uh, in, the, in Galapagos. It's a fantastic experience here between the, the very good marine life, sharks and uh, dolphins and together at some time, mm -hmm. and the iguanas and the many things that I never seen before and the uh, sea lions. So it's fantastic experience in my life. But after that, I, 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 I sailing to, to, to Marquesas and after I make my confination in uh, Fakarava in Tuamotu Islands, it's a fantastic place with a very nice uh, marine life. And uh, they start to, it's a very famous place for diving. They start to protect these areas uh, many years ago, and uh, they can they keep it uh, a very good marine life there in this atoll. I will add those places to my to go list <laughs> to dive. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maviri asked, "What is uh, what inspired uh, your passion for the ocean? O que te inspira?" I I start too young guys. I like my grand one grandfather. I I start to love the sea, to put my head in the sea, and all my life I stay in the sea. And of course, um, when I stay in the sea, or when I cross the Atlantic, or I stay many days in the sea, it's um, I have always something for to do or or read or. Um, uh, to see something different, I can relax. I can think more about my life, uh, about many things. So I have time for for for, for that. So, um, but of course, uh, I have many things that they give me much inspiration because I like very much to see the whales or dolphins. I like very much to stay in the bottom sometimes with uh, with some friends' experience, and not with the guests, but with my friends and uh, and this. So it's like that. Thank you so much for okay. your okay, kind words. Th thank you, um, thank you. You're so inspiring. Um, I, I just, I just love to to hear from you. Um, and it's, uh, it's, we are really in a critical point because, as you said, you start uh, snorkeling in Azores when you were little. Uh, I, I started when I was five years old too, and in these twenty years, I noticed that the fishes are almost gone in the places I used to go. Uh, so I'm, I just can't imagine how uh, it was uh, back um, on the, the latest uh, century. Um, so we really need to, to protect our ocean. So thank you so much, Norberto. Uh, and thank you, uh, Professor Emmanuel, for being here. It, it was a pleasure. Um, so bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joanna, Roberto, Emmanuel, and also Ricardo, who joined us via the video. That was such a fantastic session. And I think that you all really highlighted the trouble that our oceans are in, but also gave us great cause for hope and action that we need to take to be able to turn this situation around. So thank you all so much for being here today. And I hope you all have a great rest of the day.